Romans chapter number 10. Begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, is bearing his burden for his own people. Now the Romans, before they got saved, and after they got saved, they were Gentiles. Nothing changed about that. The Bible teaches that because God came into his own and his own received him not, that God opened the gospel to those that would receive it, the Gentiles. In fact, it was prophesied that his name, throughout much of the Bible, that his name would be made great among the Gentiles. And the reason for that was because his name had not been made great among his own people, Israel. Well, verse number one, the Apostle Paul says, hey, we, we know that throughout the Apostle Paul, he refers to himself as the chiefest of sinners, right? He refers to himself, oh, wretched man that I am. The Apostle Paul, even though in the eyes of the Hebrews, he was somebody to be looked up to. He was somebody to be admired. He was somebody to be followed. He was educated and someone that could make you wise. But he says, even though that's what they saw, I know that I was the worst of the worst. And he says in verse number one, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He says, I don't know why God chose to save me on the road to Damascus one day. I don't know why he chose to cry out, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? Don't know why he opened my eyes to the truth when he said, is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? He says, but I know that I'm not the best that Israel had to offer, but yet God chose me. And he says, the only difference between me and them is that somebody came to me and enlightened me, opened my eyes. And here the Apostle Paul is writing a letter because he has a burden for the people that were saved under his ministry in Rome. He's got a burden for that church. He can't be there in person. God tells him to write a letter. And in the middle of that letter, just a little bit more of his burden coming out. Saying, I wish that God would save Israel. I wish that Israel would have their eyes open. Because the Apostle Paul knows the problem that Israel had at that point is the problem that he used to have before he got saved. He says, they're no different. If God could save me, then he could save anybody. That's what the Apostle Paul's saying. And he's saying, if God chose to save me, God could choose to save Israel. It's just up to Israel. Notice he doesn't say that he prays that God would do it outside of what we would call the normal mode of salvation. He doesn't say, Lord, save them against their will. No, he says that his prayer to God is that Israel might be saved. He's praying that God doesn't turn off the opportunity for Israel to get saved. He's praying that Israel wisens up and realizes that Christ is what they need. He's praying to God saying, Lord, just give them a little bit more time. Give them all just another space of grace. Just keep the windows of heaven open a little bit longer so that they might receive what you've sent from heaven. Well, verse number two, says, for I bear them record. He says, I've seen it with my own eyes. Heard it with my own ears. He says they have a zeal for God. Zeal is a desire, a passion. But if you are zealous of something, it means usually that there's works that go along with your desire. Nobody can say that the Hebrews in this day and age or before, that they didn't have a desire for the blessings of God. They didn't have a zeal 
for the things of God. But they didn't know what they needed, and because of that, they didn't know how to get it. In this day and age, they thought that through commandments, through instruction, through discipleship and making everybody seem to be on the outside identical, that they could merit the favor of God. He says they have a zeal for God. There's a lot of people in the world today that say and claim that they're chasing after the things of God. That they're pursuing what they believe God would have them to do. There's just one problem. I don't care if the name on the placard says Baptist or any other denomination. You can have zeal all you want to. But look at the second part of verse number two. But not according to knowledge. You ever want to do something and not know how to do it? You ever launch out and try to figure it out on your own only to mess it up? That is a very short description of how there are so many people that claim to know the way to heaven and yet it doesn't agree with what the Bible says. It's because they had a zeal but they didn't have any knowledge. Now they knew stuff but they didn't know the truth. They knew what men had taught them. They knew what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, they couldn't even agree with each other. The Pharisees and Sadducees couldn't agree what happened after you died. Right? They had own internal divisions among themselves. But yet they say, you know, we know what the right answer is. Because they had a zeal. What did they want? They wanted the blessings of God, but they wanted to pay for it in their own righteousness. Well, you can't know too much about God and still believe that God's interested in what you can do for Him. They didn't have knowledge of what God desired, of what God expected, or what God was in the midst of doing in their very presence. God sent His only begotten Son, and they knew Him not. They drove them out of town on many occasions and then by the end they hand them over to be crucified by the Romans because they found them guilty in an illegal kangaroo court that happened at night which went against their own very laws. You say, what? They had a zeal for the things of God but they had no interest in hearing what God had to say. They wanted God's riches on their own terms. They had no knowledge. In truth, they had no fear or reverence of the things of God. They only wanted to be able to name and claim the parts of spirituality that they wanted to be a part of. Verse number three. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Verse number, beginning of verse number 3 says that they're ignorant of God's righteousness ignorant is not a negative connotation I wish I could go around and tell people that they were ignorant and not get angry about it I'm not calling them stupid ignorant means that you simply have no knowledge of it okay? it does not offend me if I were to go to any of y'all's jobs walk in and somebody say, what's this ignorant guy doing here? I got no idea what's going on. I know what happens at my job. I don't know what happens at your job. You know whose job I know how to do? Most days, mine. Some days, not mine. I still don't know how to do my job some days. That, that's my responsibility. We should be ignorant of some things. Right? We ought to be ignorant in some of the lasciviousness that is pervasive in the world today. Amen. Should have no knowledge of it. Have no desire for it. Amen. We shouldn't be ignorant of the devil's devices that snare and entrap us and lead us down that wide road of destruction. The Bible talks about that we're supposed to be wise as serpents yet harmless as doves. What's that mean? There are some things that it's okay to know. 
Because by knowing those things, you can better protect yourself, protect the church, protect your home, and ultimately make a bigger or greater impact in those around you. Because you are securing or building up the things of God, making them sure. Making sure that there aren't any cracks in the foundation. I mean, but Clint just read about it over in Isaiah, that it would be said to that generation that they were the restorers, that they were the ones that established or built up the foundations of many generations. That doesn't do us any good to bury our head in the sand. But it also doesn't do you any good to be ignorant of what it is that God desires, what God expects, what God finds acceptable, what God finds despicable. You don't just get to join the family of God without any responsibility. As part of the family, you have a standard that you're supposed to live up to. You know what it is? Christ. Amen. They were ignorant of the righteousness of God. They knew nothing about it. Which makes sense. Because if they did know about the righteousness of God, they wouldn't have been too impressed with their own righteousness. You know one of the moments of conviction when God deals with you about getting saved is that you realize everything that you thought had value really isn't all that valuable. When God opens your eyes to the fact that what you were trusting in can't hold any water, that the bucket that you were hoping in didn't have a bottom to it, right? the thing that you were holding on to as an anchor really could move at any time, that's when you understand that the righteousness that God had is anchored within the veil. It's unshakable. It's unmovable. He is the rock, the foundation that cannot be moved. And he says, put your trust in him. His righteousness fulfilled the law. We struggle to even remember it, let alone keep it. His righteousness was one that through 33 and a half years with sinless perfection. Right? I can't even get out of the bed without thinking a thought that I hate myself, let alone other people. Right? By the time I look in the mirror, right, I'm not impressed. But yet Israel at the time were very impressed with their own works. They had been deceived. They knew who they were. They knew that they were sinful. They knew that they needed God, but they had been deceived, lied to, and bought hook, line, and sinker that as long as they did X, Y, and Z, that they could still find favor in the eyes of God. They were putting faith in what they could do. That's the second part of verse number three. And going about to establish their own righteousness. It wasn't enough that they were clinging to their own righteousness. They were trying to establish it as the norm instead of the righteousness of God. They said, if it's good enough for me to be righteous, you too can do it. Follow this 12-step program. Or read 40 days of purpose and you too can start living a righteous life. Spiritually, every day can be a Friday. What are they trying to do? They're trying to convince you that what they have is more righteous than what you have. Because if you believe that, you'll want to establish that in your life because you think it'll bring you closer to God. All that is, is what nowadays, or since about, you know, the 60s has been taught in colleges around America, it's called humanism. That you have the power to do what you want to do in your life. That's not a new concept. That's been around since Adam and Eve in the garden when they chose to disobey what God had instructed them and substitute their own desires in, their, in its place. You know what that was? They thought that they could make themselves like God. Well, God already did that. He made them in His own image. He breathed into them the very breath of life from His own mouth. They made them as he desired them to be and as they needed to be. But yet they wanted to establish their own righteousness. Happened with Cain and Abel. 
Cain rejected what God said was righteous and what he would find acceptable, and he substituted something else in its place. And when God rejected it, he got angry at God because Cain thought his righteousness was more impressive than Abel's righteousness. When you're ignorant of what true righteousness is, it's easy to buy anything that looks good, sounds good, or to the flesh makes sense. It's easy to be deceived into thinking that something is righteous. There's a real easy solution for that. You could put two things next to each other and compare them. You know why today the religious part of society as a whole is ridiculed and mocked? Because there's been a lot of people since the advent of radio and the television that have claimed that what they had was righteousness only to come to find out in a very public manner that what they had was a bunch of foolishness and in a lot of cases what they had was a whole lot of wickedness. Don't think that the devil didn't take advantage of every time somebody that claimed the name of God when really they were serving themselves that he doesn't take the opportunity that when so and so who everybody knew was a fraud falls well all of a sudden that's another preacher that wasn't a preacher that was a hireling that was a gainsayer that's something that the Bible teaches against but in the eyes of the world it's all the same why? because they're ignorant of true righteousness true righteousness doesn't tell you that you're wrong it shows you what you're missing true righteousness doesn't come around and beat you with a hammer for not being righteous it extends a hand that says come unto me Christ not once ever turned away, turned away one that came to him with a true sincere plea to receive from him what it was that they needed sometimes they left before they understood what it was Christ was trying to tell them that'd be the young ruler that Jesus told to sell everything he had give it to the poor take up his cross and follow him that wasn't the answer that he was looking for he thought he could keep righteousness and riches at the same time which is totally possible but Jesus demonstrated to him that his riches meant more to him than the righteousness of God. When you seek to establish your own righteousness, that means that you have to unestablish or de-establish the righteousness of God as the standard in your life. You can only have one. I don't know about you. Every now and then I do have to measure things at work. There's only two things that I measure with. A, tape measure if we need general. Or if we need real specific ones, I got real precise calipers that'll tell me down to the fraction of a millimeter and an inch. Right, the exact length of something. I don't carry three and four calipers with me just in case one of them's wrong. I found one that was right and I'm sticking with it. I don't carry three and four tape measures around with me. I found one that's good enough and we hang on to it. People are the same way in their life. They're not juggling different standards throughout the week. They find one that they think works for them and they establish it in their life and that's their measuring stick. It's just one problem. True righteousness is not established by you. It's already been established from the beginning in heaven. Look at the latter part of verse number 3. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Doesn't say that they didn't establish the righteousness of God. You can't establish the righteousness of God because he's the one that established it. It doesn't need fixing. It's still perfectly square. Yeah. It's not in danger of tipping over or falling over. The righteousness of God is foolproof. It's steadfast and sure. It's unshakable. Because his righteousness is because of his holiness. God established his righteousness because he was the only one that had the authority to establish what righteousness was. So he set the standard. We've already talked about it. It's Christ. 
That doesn't move. So, what it says is that they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. It means they had the opportunity to use God's righteousness as their measuring stick, but they've rejected it. God has already established his righteousness. It's just whether or not you want to submit to using his standards. Paul said that the Israelites had a zeal for the things of God, but they had no knowledge. They were ignorant. They thought that their own measuring sticks of righteousness were good enough. That that was enough to merit the blessings of God. They didn't want the responsibilities that go along with it. That's why they sought to establish their own righteousness. But here, the latter part of verse 3, says that they had not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Nowhere in verse number 3 does the Apostle Paul recognize that what the Israelites were seeking after was actually righteous. He called it their own righteousness. Just because somebody says that what they're seeking is the right thing to do doesn't mean that it is. Just because someone seeks to do good things does not mean that the manner in which they do it is righteous. You've heard me say you can do the right thing the wrong way. And you know what it makes it? Wrong. But the problem is not that they weren't seeking after righteousness. They rejected and they would not submit to what? God's righteousness. True righteousness. Then in verse number 4, he gives the theological answer as to why God's righteousness is the only righteousness. Because before the law, before grace... Before there ever was a church. Before Adam and Eve ever existed. Before God in Genesis chapter number 1 spoke and said, Let there be light, God still had righteousness. And verse number 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. The Apostle Paul is the one that wrote that the law was our schoolmaster to show us that we were not righteous. The Jews had bought into the lie that by striving to keep the law, you could obtain righteousness. That's not true. By striving to keep the law, you showed to God that you submitted to what His standard was. And you acknowledged that you were not good enough to uphold it. The law was to show you that you were not righteous. And yet they were trying to establish the things that they could do for God. They could do nothing for God. But God could do a whole lot for them. Amen. They desired all of those choice blessings as God's chosen people without any of the responsibility. Which was what? Submitting to what God's standard was. Amen. You know why Christ ended the law? Because Christ was righteous long before the law ever existed. The law was a measuring stick to show you that you were not Christ. The law was a measuring stick that today shows you you're still in need of a Savior. Amen. We love grace, but without law, we would not realize all the reasons that we are not what God expects and what God finds acceptable. Grace covereth a multitude of sin, but you don't know that you need grace until you compare yourself to the law. Even the law, God said, if you could keep it, still wouldn't be good enough because you were born in sin conceived in sin even if from the moment that you took your first breath until the time that you passed away you did not commit a sin you were still born a sinner the law could not redeem you the law showed you how to get into a position that you could receive the blessings of God that your sins could be covered for a time not forgiven until the Lamb came to set captivity captive. The righteousness of God predated the law. It predates this earth. It predates the very alpha of time. When he says, I am that I am, God exists because he is holy and righteous. And because he is holy and righteous, God exists. 
We're getting way out into the deep stuff. That's why I like to think every now and then, and then I can't ever make sense of it. You know why? Because I'm not God. I can't understand God. I do my best, and you know what I come to find out? He's God. He's bigger and greater than we are. His ways are above our ways. Doesn't mean I still don't like making the attempt. But God is who He is because of God's righteousness. It's a part of Him. Amen. It's part of why Isaiah testified or prophesied that His names, right? We like the Prince of Peace, but you know what that everlasting Father speaks to? The fact that He always has been and the only reason that He's ever been able to be since the beginning of time, before time even existed, is because he is righteous. People like to celebrate the fact that Jesus came, but they ignore the fact, they are ignorant to the idea that Jesus had to come because man's righteousness wasn't enough. It was already established in heaven. He came to make it known and make it evident in person that God's righteousness was the only standard that God found acceptable. If the law was enough, why was John the Baptist preaching that repent and be baptized in the wilderness? If the law was enough and it was simply a choice whether or not you wanted to become righteous on your own, right? why would men like David when they sin ask for God's forgiveness? You realize that if you could be righteous, you could forgive sins? That's why Christ had to come. He said he forgave sins. You know why? Because he was getting ready to pay for them. If you buy it, you can forgive it, you can take it away, you can make it as if it never existed. There's not one thing that I can do for you that will absolve you or that I could forgive you of any of the things that are attached to your soul. That takes a righteous God. And you know how you gain access to that righteousness? It's not by puffing up your shirt, peacocking, showing everything that you can do for God. No, it's on your hands and knees, prostrate before an almighty, thrice holy God, where you submit yourself to His righteousness. If we had time, we could do a series on all the different religions throughout history and how what they did was the exact opposite of one recognizing the righteousness of God and then submitting to it. Verse number three is the reason that there have been disagreements and wars and there have been inquisitions and slaughters of countless innocents because people wanted to bicker among themselves on what righteousness was when God already had the standard. Nowhere do I find that we're supposed to cut down and take those that believe in false righteousness or self-righteousness that we're supposed to take them out and stone them. That we're supposed to remove them forcefully. No, I'd show that we're supposed to be a light under those people. They got flashlights with dead batteries in it. And they want to know why they can't make sense of things in the world. You're supposed to be the Duracell version of their flashlight. Doesn't matter, rain, snow, sleet. If you need it, throw the switch. You've got light. That's supposed to be you. You know why? Because our righteousness really does shine. Not because it's of us, but because of who gave it to us. I have no claim to righteousness. Y'all realize that? We're robed in His righteousness. It still belongs to Him. I've got no claim to it. I didn't even put the robe on me. Let alone have anything to do with what went into making it or keeping it the way that it is. In fact, when I soil it, 
when it gets dirty, I have to come back, 1 John 1, 9, and confess so that he can cleanse and forgive me of all unrighteousness. All that I have is unrighteous, but yet he gives me all righteousness to be robed in. Because he knows that I can't find favor in the eyes of the Father if I'm clothed and robed as myself. Hallelujah, when the Father sees me, he sees his Son. Because I've been cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. But do you understand how easy it is? I know everybody does. But how easy it is to think for just one second that you're going to go out and you're going to do this and that God will be pleased with it. Well, why? Will God be pleased with it because it's what God told you to do and you submitted to it and you obeyed what God told you to do? You did it to the best of your ability because according on the, you know, I could stand on the Bible and say according to what God wrote, God will be pleased with that. If you gave it everything you had, you did it the exact way that God told you to and you did it in the spirit of service, God will be pleased with that. But if you think God's going to be pleased with it because you're the one that's doing it, nope. Many a time, God had a servant that got too big for their britches, and God would use things like roosters and donkeys to do some preaching Amen. just to prove that it wasn't about the vessel that delivered the message. It was about the one that sent it. Israel knew not the righteousness of God. I'm convinced that there's a lot of people sitting on church pews today and churches that preach the right Bible, that have a pastor that may have the right spirit, but yet they know nothing about the righteousness of God. All they know is the righteousness of self or the righteousness of others. They've never known the true righteousness of God. Are you saying that they're not saved? That's between them and God. But you cannot do some of the things that so-called church people do if you've been exposed to the true righteousness of God. Just getting a glimpse of it anywhere in the Bible, it says that men fall down as dead men before Him. They can't even stand the presence of His glory, let alone His righteousness. You know when the Bible says that our God is a consuming fire? You know what does that consuming? It's His righteousness. Anything that is not righteous cannot get past the righteousness of God. It gets consumed, ate up, gone away with, because it does not meet the standard of God. You're telling me that somebody who claims to be right with God, claims to be a servant of God, but yet their life and their actions are directly opposed to what this says, that's not righteousness. And the reason I say they don't know true right because if they get close enough to God to know true righteousness, those things would have been consumed out of their life. God would have removed it. Long before they approached, God would have dealt with them about it. I wonder how many people have known the righteousness of God. They understand that they had to submit in order to get saved, but yet they still seek to establish their own righteousness to ease their own conscience. You know what revival is? It's giving you another glimpse of who God is to put things into perspective in your life and understand, Lord, you're right. I'm not where I need to be. It's holding your measuring step up to God's and saying, that don't track. I need to jump that. Revival is stirring up once again those emotions that you once used to have because you love the righteousness of God. When you love it, you'll seek to keep it. Revival is remembering the importance of what it is that we were called to do. We were called to take that righteousness to a lost and dying world so that they can understand that they stand in need of a Savior. It's not our job to convict them. That's the Holy Ghost's job. Amen. 
It's not our job to convert them. Once again, Holy Ghost's job. It's not our job to consecrate them. The Holy Ghost does that. You know what our job is to do? We're supposed to tell them. Then after they get saved, by the grace of God, we're to do our best to disciple them, to develop them as Christians, to show them that the righteousness of God is worth pursuing. We're to be examples unto them. That if you cling to what God established long ago, it doesn't matter what comes into your life, doesn't matter what you face, it'll all wash out. But yet the righteousness of God is cemented forever. That's what Job said. The Lord give, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. You know why the name of the Lord still deserved to be blessed? Because he was righteous. It had nothing to do with what Job received from God. It had everything to do about who God was long before Job was ever made. We're supposed to be a demonstration that if we deny self and embrace Christ, that God can do great things in our life. Some people are aware of the righteousness of God. They just don't submit to it. Which doesn't make sense to me. I've seen a lot of cars. I've driven a few of them. But see, one day I saw this thing called an Aston Martin Vanquish that had a V12 engine in it. And ever since, other cars don't look like cars anymore. They look like tin cans and toys. Right? Cars don't sound that impressive once you've heard 12 cylinders compared to six, okay? Now, does that mean I'm ever going to get one? No. But once you see something that is, quote-unquote, real, it puts into perspective everything else. If you're saved in order to embrace anything other than God's righteousness, you have to deceive yourself into forgetting what it was that you know is true. That's something that the flesh is really good at. You know what submission is the act of? Keeping the flesh where it needs to be. On that cross that he told you to take up and follow him with. Submission is the wrestling with self, not wrestling with God. Submission is the act of saying, Lord, here I am. I'm not resisting. I'm not going to rebuff what it is that you give me. I want to be completely compliant with what it is you want in my life. You know why Israel had a problem with that? It means that they couldn't control it anymore. In order to submit, you are giving control over everything unto God. If he says jump, you don't get to ask how high. He just said jump. God knows how high you can jump. If God told you to jump, it's because he wanted you to jump. But yet we get involved and convince ourselves that we can't do what it is that God expects us to do. And as a result, we need to find a new standard. Because obedience isn't a standard that we like when we're disobedient. Righteousness doesn't get the job done anymore when we know that what we've done is unrighteousness. That's the same situation that Israel was in. Same situation that the Pharisees were perpetuating in that day the same one that the Sadducees they're still arguing today you all know that over things that don't matter that in the span of eternity it doesn't matter whether or not on the Saturday you shaved with an electric razor blade or whether you had a straight razor but yet there are people that are practicing Orthodox Jews today that they have different bathrooms that they use on Saturdays as opposed to other days of the week because they believe that they must keep the Sabbath holy as the law said. There's just one problem. That's not righteousness. Righteousness was already made manifest. It's in verse number four. Christ. He made the righteousness of God available to all men because men's righteousness was never going to be enough.
as one songwriter said, mercy built a bridge. You know why? Because what you needed, you couldn't get on your side. You had to cross the bridge in order to gain access to the righteousness of God. The Apostle Paul's heartbroken in verse number one. He says, it's my heart's desire. It's his prayer towards God that Israel be saved. And he knows that if he wants to be obedient to God, at that point in time, and maybe for the rest of his life, he couldn't be involved in the outreach ministry to those people. They were the people that were dearest to him. They were his own people. They were his family, his friends, former colleagues. They were his people. And yet he knows that his mission, if he wants to be submissive to the Lord, if he wants to be of service to the Lord, it's to go to the rest of the world at that point. The rest of the known world. He's traveling everywhere except the place that he has the biggest burden for. His own people. You know what the Apostle Paul could have done? He, like many other people in the early church, could have decided that they wanted the righteousness of God, but they wanted to add works to it. Well, there's just a problem with that. You know what that's called? Unrighteousness. Because God's righteousness doesn't need any other ingredients. The only thing you can do to it is spoil it. In fact, the Apostle Paul had to come back and rebuke Peter to the face. It says, withstood him to the face about what? The act of circumcision. That was the law. The law and grace don't mix. Either grace is enough to save you, or Christ was a liar. That's what it came down to. And Peter said, you know what? That's right. There's no place for works when it comes to salvation. There's no difference between Jew and the Greek, as the New Testament says. Because the law had been fulfilled, not by man, but by Christ. Many times it would have been easy for the Apostle Paul to deceive himself in his flesh and say, it's the will of God for me to go back to Israel. That should be my mission field. I know them better than anybody else. I've got the intellect to reason with them when it comes to all of their philosophical and theological debates. I've got the former position to say, I know what it is that you believe, whether or not you're going to say it. And here's what God has to say on the issue. There was just one problem with that. That's not what God wanted the Apostle Paul to do. Disobedience in part is still wholly disobedient. That's why God removed his hand from King Saul over being king of Israel. Because he was disobedient. So many times it's the reason that people in the Bible suffered the chastisement or the judgment of God is because they were knowingly disobedient. Why do you think Jonah spent so many days in the belly of a great fish? because he was disobedient. Righteousness is all-encompassing. Either you are righteous or you are not. It's black and white. Just like the bright line between sin and not sin. Righteousness cannot be obtained, but you can attain a status through Christ. You know what that status is? You've received the adoption of sonship, whereby you can cry, Abba, Father. You know what that gives you? That gives you a claim to God. Not because you were righteous, but because He imparted His righteousness to you. He gave it to you. And if He gave it to you, nobody can take it away, but you can choose to not embrace it. You can choose to let that robe of righteousness become very dingy without asking him to clean it up. Nothing you do can impact the righteousness of God, but it can cover it up. 
You can't have a mirror that's so dirty you can't see into it. That's what the flesh does. It tries to obscure the righteousness that God has put inside of us so that others cannot see it. We're just meant to be mirrors of what God put inside of us. But anytime we cling to something other than the righteousness of God, all we're doing is accepting how much dirt we're going to let get on the mirror before we let it affect us. Because we think that's good enough. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.